Our, spe uh, our speaker is Professor Jerzy Kowalski Glickman, and the title of his talk is uh, Charges of Supergravity and Positive Energy Theorem. Jerzy, please begin your talk. Oh. Jurek, can you hear me? Jurek, huh. can you hear me? Huh. Hello? So welcome everyone again. Uh, our speaker is Professor Jerzy Kowalski Glickman, and the title of his talk is Charges of Supergravity and Positive Energy Theorem. Jerzy, uh, please begin your talk. Okay, so let me start again. Uh, uh, there were some doubts, so let me just assure you that uh, this uh, talk is not intended to be a joke. You, you. I mean, Jacek was not was was not sure. Uh, right. It, now it's going to be okay. Good. Uh, can I can I walk or should I stand? Because you know I, I need to to do my steps, and this is uh, the best opportunity of doing steps. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, all right. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, this talk is about a project that we started some time ago with Remigius Durka. Uh, uh, I hoped that we would finish it by by now, but we unfortunately we didn't. So uh, I will spend most of the time telling you about things that are. Uh, well known, and then at the end of the uh, at the end of the talk, I will I will give you a little bit. I will tell you a little bit about the project that we are that you are doing now. But I but I, I I believe there is there is something really very interesting about uh, about positive energy theorem and also about supergravity. So let me let me start with the outline. So let me first tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'll get I'll go to details. Well, so first of all, what is the supersymmetry? Supersymmetry is a symmetry that combines space-time Poincaré symmetry that we know uh, that we know from quantum field theory or just a standard quantum field theory, and the symmetry that exchanges boson and fermions. And for uh, you know, for for people who are as old as me, as myself, uh, you you certainly remember that at some point it was a great excitement about supersymmetry. People thought that the supersymmetric theory and especially supergravity would be a theory of everything. Everybody got excited. And at some point, uh, people got even more excited because it turned out that the string, the string theory that was supposed to be again, well, the, the new incarnation of theory of everything needs supersymmetry just for consistency, at least. What it seems so then, since people believed in string theory, and I think some of the people still believe string theory, it was natural to expect that supersymmetry is a symmetry of nature. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't see we didn't see any trace of it. Well, yet there was this famous bet in uh, twenty years ago when LHC started, and people to wager uh, if the symmetry is to be observed by 2016, but it wasn't observed by 2016. Uh, uh, this is funny because, well, it, it was, it, the, the, this wager was, was taken at some of, of uh, at the conference, the particle physics conference, so I don't know many of the names, but Toft, girl Toft, soberly, uh, uh, said that there is no chance that the symmetry is going to be observed, and some particle theorist uh, 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 well 
voted for, for yes. And well, what, what we know at this moment is that at least, at least uh, at LHC, we don't see any traces of, of, of supersymmetry. This does not exclude a possibility that supersymmetry is somehow uh, a symmetry of nature at high energies, but at this moment, there is no indication that it is the, this is the case. On the other hand, uh, supersymmetry and supergravity, which is a theory of local supersymmetry, uh, is interesting, is an interesting theory by itself. It's an interesting theoretical concept. It's a just, it's an interesting, and well, there are some restrictions for it to how uh, 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 there are some restrictions known uh, by Coleman under the name of Norm Coleman Mandula theorem of how one can extend the Poincare symmetry of uh, local quantum field theory. And it turns out that the super supersymmetry is one of the few exceptions where this extension is possible consistent or non-trivial extension is possible. So the, the, my point, the, the point I want to make here is that supersymmetry is not, doesn't seem to be at this, at this moment to be really a symmetry of nature, but on the other hand, it's an interesting theoretical concept that actually can be used for some other purposes. And from the perspective of gravity theory, the most remarkable fact about supersymmetry is this relation, namely, and I will just, I will tell you more about it in a moment, but the relation is that energy or the quantum mechanical operator, quantum mechanical Hamiltonian is roughly speaking proportional to the square of a, of the supercharge, which is a, a conserved charge associated with supersymmetry. And since it is a square, it's manifestly positive. On the other hand, Objection. is the right hand side really a number? Uh, I, I said roughly. Yeah. Okay, I, I, will, I will be very precise in a moment. What, what, what does mean? No, it's, it's yeah. We, we, we can discuss it in a moment, okay? When I come to when I come to this, okay. So so this is just an observation. It was made in the very early stages of, of a very early stage of, of development of supersymmetry in the in mid seventies. Basically, there is this relation between the Hamiltonian and the super supercharge. And if I take any uh, so uh, in. Uh, this, I would believe, I mean, uh, apart from subtleties, you might think that if you have a, if you have a reasonably uh, well-behaving Hilbert space of states, this operator is manifestly, uh, when we sandwich it between, between the states of this Hilbert space of the theory, this, is my, this, man, this operator is manifestly positive, or, or the expectation value of this operator is manifestly positive, which means that the expectation value of energy within the states is also positive, which is just, a, this just follows from the algebra, but this actually gave hope because at the same time in middle seventies, people got interested again, or they, they kept being interested <coughs> in the question, is the, is the energy of gravity, of configuration of gravitational field and some other fields, is, is the energy positive or not positive? And it turned out it's, it's not completely trivial to, or, or far from being trivial to, to see uh, what sign it is. Okay, about 40 years ago, so that's, that's a point, use this simple fact to prove that the energy of asymptotically flat space-time or asymptotically anti the sitter space-time is positive. And most of, the, most of the talk I will actually spend telling you the story of this. So the outline, uh, uh, which is, so, so how to prove it? So basically the idea is to construct asymptotic charges of supergravity, the theory with local supersymmetry, uh, and then use this algebra. So this algebraic result that E is something like Q squared to, to, to show that indeed the energy, the energy is positive. And what is, what, what what is something that we are going, our project that I, I, I hope I will be able to tell you a little bit about would be actually to, 
to do the same thing, to start repeating the same thing and the same analysis for the charges that are defined for finite regions. Then, uh, and then I don't know. I mean, I, I think this is, this is something that, that we're gonna, that we're, uh, that we'd like to check. And I don't know at this moment, I don't know many, many solid results. So this is just, just a research project. But as I told you, I would like to spend most of the time just discussing positive energy theorem and supersymmetry, the relation between them. Then I spent some time uh, uh, telling you about uh, our formulation of supergravity and the charge and the conserved charges associated with regions. And then I will end up with some, I will end up with some questions. All right, so let me start with the positive energy and gravity. And I think that, mm, uh, let, let me start with a simple, very, very simple model so that you I can actually understand uh, what the problem in physical terms is about without any, uh, without any technical details. And this is something that I borrowed, this model I borrowed from, uh, from Stanley Des lectures, lecture notes or a review paper but I think it's now, it was known to, 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 to many people, so there is nothing special, particularly new about it. So think about, suppose I have some configuration. So I take, I have a region of, of size R. So this is kind of a scale, the blend scale of a system, naturally associated with the system. There is a distribution of matter of total mass M0 in this region. And then if I would, if I, if I actually e, e, pre-GR in the pre-GR or Newtonian in Newtonian setting, the total energy of this configuration is actually what? Well, it's a rest energy of this mass M0 plus the gravitational energy, a gravitational self energy of this mass M0, okay? And this expression, you know, if you look at this expression, this expression might be positive or must be neg might be negative. There, there is nothing about the sign of this that we can really say. But then when we start thinking, basically thinking uh, in, the, in, G, in, in Einsteinian way about gravity in which uh, all forms of energy is a source of gravitational energy. So all, all matter, this, every, all the energies are actually a source of gravity then this equation, essentially this message can be accommodated into this equation in the following way. Well, there is still the rest mass, but the gravitational energy of the configuration must include also the energy of gravity itself. So instead of this equation, I have this equation, and then I can actually solve it. And Solving this simple quadratic equation, I get, the, I get the following solution. There is another branch, which is the negative branch of this solution, of course, because it's quadratic equation, but I choose the positive one uh, because I want in the limit of G going to zero. So when I switch, in, when I switch off gravity, I want M to become M zero, right? So if gravity is not present, G, M must be equal to M zero. And you see that this, um, uh, this actually satisfies uh, satisfies this limit, this this kind of a limiting condition, and the other branch you can you can check it easily doesn't. Okay, so this was indicate. This is extremely naive, of course, but this was indicate that indeed uh, in gravitating system the total energy should be positive. Okay, so. Three proofs of positive energy theorem. This positive, the positive energy theorem has been was proved finally at the at the end of uh, at the end of seventies. Uh, but it's uh, the, the problem was stated, I think, already in the early sixties or even before that. So clearly, already after ADM paper about asymptotic mass and asymptotic momenta, it was clear that. Uh, one would like to understand if the energy as measured by asymptotic observer is positive or negative in general for, for gravitating uh, for, for any 
for any system with gravity with some reasonably behaving matter, uh, reasonably behaving matter. Okay, so the proof, the first proof was given by Shen and Yao in this in the famous paper in 1979. I, I don't know anything about the proof, but already all the audience or uh, virtually here are experts who, who know everything about it. Uh, uh, essentially, that was some kind of well, that they, they used the formal differential geometry techniques. In 1981, Witten in a paper that I, I always thought and I actually read it uh, uh, last, uh, last month again. It, it's a really a remarkable, a extremely beautiful paper, uh, which is clear and simple. Uh, so I recommend everyone who, who really wants to to see a piece of the of wonderful crystal creole mathematical physics to, to just to look at this paper, the proof, the, which is called the new proof of positive energy theorem, or simple, I'm sorry, simple proof of positive energy theorem. So Wheaton presented a simple proof of positive energy theorem motivated by supersymmetry. So <clears throat> he really, is, and he admits even he, at some point in the paper that he really was uh, interested to understand what the, su the, the supersymmetry argument in the context of positive energy theorem or, or stability of Minkowski space, but he never actually uses supersymmetry explicitly. And then uh, there was a naive formal proof of positive energy theorem based on supersymmetry, which was proposed first by Desser and Teitelboim. And then Grisaro clarified a little bit in 1977. So it was even before the, the formal proof of Shunden and Yahoo. And I think it was already an important achievement because it really, uh, I mean, the proof was technically not, not convincing, but it was still tell, tell, tells you how, the, how to proceed. And then after Witten, uh, the relation between Susi and supersymmetry and Witten's proof was clarified then uh, I don't know, within a couple of years or three years after the Witten's paper was clarified by a number of people. Uh, I will follow the approach of, of another beautiful paper by Horowitz and Strominger, but there was a paper by Hall and Desser and Teitelbaum uh, together and, uh, and uh, apart that they, they, they actually published a number of papers around 1984. So, uh, which actually made it possible to understand the relation between uh, the relation between supersymmetry and this former equality inequality that I showed you a moment ago and and the positive energy proof so let me go let me just go to details when I should finish so Mr. let's say Chairman. as usually we've got one hour let's say let's okay say, so I need to finish about 10 past 12 right uh, yes uh, let's say uh, may I comment a little? For instance, Witten, of course, is nice, but 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 you should add Nestor. Uh, as, because oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Nestor Witten. Concerning Shen and Yao, it was uh, uh, proof which was precise, but 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 the ideas came from Geroch, so so it was much earlier. There was. I uh, came from what? Uh, Young, Geroch. Uh, I from Geroch, yes. Yes, yes. So, so that's so, true. And, and in that's fact, uh, this garage technique was an, uh, involved uh, by. Uh, I have problem with names. Okay, but but at the end there is this Hiske and Ilman uh, paper, which is more mathematical, which cl clarifies this inverse mean curvature flow, and and the, the, this inverse mean curvature was inverse mean curvature flow was behind the positivity of energy. So even even for black hole, not only just yeah. Okay, okay. Would, okay. So, the, so this was just the comment. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, I, I certainly should. I certainly should uh, mention Nestor and uh, Raula or Raula. I don't remember the name. Who actually uh, in Witten proof in, in Witten proof there is uh, one uh, loose end which is about invertibility of particular equations. So you really need to make sure that some 
the, the Dirac equation has the is invertible, so it has a well behaving uh, <coughs> green function, and we, we didn't, didn't show it precisely, but but the Nestor did. All right. So, uh, so let me actually tell you what is the what is the idea of Witten. Uh, so the, the point is the following: take an asymptotically flat spacetime, satisfying this this condition with energy momentum with the energy of matter being equal zero. Uh, in in a particular, uh, well, you, you need to go to, to, to infinity along some hypersurface. So let us consider this hypersurface to be a hypersurface of constant time, just, just for simplicity, but of course you can generalize it. So suppose the energy of the of the matter of the matter uh, of matter is actually positive. And then the question is: what is the sign of this object? This is the ADM, ADM mass. It's expressed by the uh, by the sphere by, by the integral of a sphere at infinity of some component of the metric. And of course, we assume that the, this, this is on shell in the sense that this metric is a solution of Einstein equations. And the positive energy theorem says that E is positive. So this is this is what we start with. And what are uh, what uh, what Witten did, he actually started his consideration with analyzing this, the following equation, the Dirac equation on the hypersurface, on the hypersurface, assume this is in, in the hypersurface of constant time. And there are two points of, of uh, there the are several steps in the proof. Well, the first step in the proof is that uh, Witter proves that there always exists a solution of this equation satisfying the following boundary condition, so that the epsilon, the spinner here, actually asymptotically goes to some constant spinner plus the correction, which is of order of one over R. So this is, and this is actually, if you look at the paper, that it takes most of the time for Witten to show that. And here we also need to, uh, here you also need the, here you also, you, you really, in the course of this proof, you need this result of the really, to, to make it really precise, you really need this result of this. Then what Witten observes, this is something that, uh, that this is actually a crucial observation is the following if i if you look at this uh, at this uh, if you look at the at the uh, if you take this equation and just consider a commutator of two different or of two dirac operators or two differential operators acting on epsilon then using the uh, the, the the commutator of two covariant derivatives is essentially proportional to is essentially proportional to curvature. So if you start if you do some if you play with it a little bit if you massage this something that is or, or, or that is tri that is simple which is that the commutator of two covariant derivatives proportional to curvature acting on something and then using this Dirac equation and using Einstein equation you actually get obtain this identity, which is, which is really very nice. Well, this is kind of, a, uh, of the extension of this, the, the, this combination of energy momentum tensor is kind of a extension of what, uh, of what, we, uh, of what we had be before this uh, with this T0, only with T0, so this is just a combination of energy. And you may think that this is kind of a momentum uh, uh, kind of a momentum of a matter. All right. So then uh, Witten considers the following integral. Assume, uh, think about the integral of epsilon star covariant derivative epsilon integrated over a surface at infinity. Then what you well, so you can convert it into the into into the volume integral. Star is, I think, the same as bar, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, let me see. Uh, I am, uh, well, as a, at the moment, I, 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 I mm, 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 mm. let me see if it is indeed. Uh, I'm not sure it should be star. It's not really bar. There is no gamma zero there. Yeah, okay. So, so this is just a star. 
Uh, so if you if you consider this, then you convert it into then you convert it to the volume integral, which again you can rewrite in the following in the volume in the following form using this identity, right? So uh, so you, then you integrate put, put this differentiation here. So you have this term, and then if differentiation hits here, then you use this then you do use this uh, this identity to express it in this form. And this is this thing, this object is manifestly positive because it's just an integral of a square. This is positive again because you assume when you assume the dominant energy condition. So these two terms, the sum of this, this is just a sum of two positive terms. So this object is positive. On the other hand, and this. Yeah, that's right. But four pi g is usually one. It's a positive. It's, it's a positive number one. Right. Okay. Good. But and then eight pi g is one. Uh, it, it depends. Okay. Anyway, uh, so uh, let me go, go back. So this expression is positive, but then what we can shows is that this expression actually can be, the, 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 the S can be expressed, that this is kind of a surface integral. It can be actually expressed in terms as a combination of the energy of ADM energy and ADM momentum. But this is positive. And then from this, by just tracing, uh, 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 the, from this, uh, you can actually derive that energy is larger than the modulus of momentum, which is larger than zero. This is essentially the... Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, yes, that, that's the, the whole point. I mean, the, we can show uh, painfully that the solution, that there does not exist the solution of this uh, Dirac equation, which is later called Witten equation with the boundary condition that epsilon, epsilon asymptotically is zero, okay? So there are no zero modes in this equation, no asymptotic zero modes of this equation. This is, this is the this most painful mathematical part of the proof. All right. Good. So, uh, and of course, uh, well, this proof, the De Witten's proof is very simple. It's- Sorry, again, question, sorry. Uh, the, the circuit on which this inner equation is it must be it must be a full section of the paper. Yeah? For yes. Instance, for the general diagram of charge, it will be between two. Uh, okay, good. So, 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 in the original Witten's proof, uh, there are no there are no uh, no inside horizons, so black holes are not allowed. But uh, this was generalized later by Hawking, Perry, and, and someone, I don't know who, perhaps Gibbons. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was uh, a couple of years later, it was generalized. Uh, and I, I'm sure there was Hawking and Perry, but there were, and there was a third author, which might be Gibbons, but I don't remember, uh, that was generalized to space times with, with the inner horizons. Okay. okay. Good. So let me now turn to supersymmetry take on this. Uh, as, I, as I stress, the Witten's proof is motivated, was motivated by supersymmetry, but it was not really, he didn't, he, he never used supersymmetry in, 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 this, in this proof. Okay, so let me actually start talking to tell you a little bit about the supersymmetry. Well, the supersymmetry is an extension of Poincaré symmetry that includes supersymmetry between bosons and fermions among defining. So, okay, so this is the extension of Poincaré symmetry. Of Poincaré symmetry. Let me, I'm sorry, just for a sec, uh, just a sec. Okay, so, if you think about the generators of supersymmetry, there are just 10 Poincaré generators corresponding to what? To the momenta and angular momenta or to translations and rotations and Lorentz rotations. And in addition to them, there is a, 
uh, there is a Q generator, the generator of supersymmetry. The, this is what, what the supersymmetry generator does in acting on bosonic states is produced fermionic states and vice versa. That's the idea. And well, the, the, the commutator algebra, well, okay. Well, this, this operator is, is anti-commuting. So instead of commutators, we have anti-commutators because it's essentially a fermionic operator. So you have anti-commutators, but the algebra, the total algebra consists of the standard, at least in the, in the flat case, in the Poincaré case, consists of standard Poincaré generators, as I told you, with standard with the standard uh, with the standard commutators, the commutator of translation or momenta with Q is zero, and the committee and the they transform under Lorentz transformation and rotation they transform like like spinners. Uh, and in addition, the only additional commutator or anti-commutator to be precise is this one, uh, uh, which tells you that the anti-commutator of this two. Uh, Q and Q bar, Q with Q is zero and Q bar with Q bar is zero, but Q with Q bar is actually proportional to, proportional to momentum, which is a remarkable, a remarkable commutator. So if I naively multiply everything by gamma zero and take a trace, then I find that energy, which is P zero, uh, well, there is some, you, okay, there is here is something like that there is a Planck lens here, but anyway, what we really want for dimensional reasons, but what we really what, what we really find is that this is this is basically this is this is a sum of squares and, and this is basically positive. This but this is of course it, it, well I shouldn't really say positive because it's it's supposed to be an operator equation, right? You really need to realize this operator somehow. This is a quantum, this is supposed to be a quantum theory because of the fermions, non commutative fermions, they're, they're quantum operators and stuff. So, but the, but what, uh, uh, but what you can really do, you can actually argue that in the limit of no fermionic external lines. So if a, you have no asymptotic fermionic states and no loops, so you would go with AG bar to zero, the same conclu conclusion should hold in classical gravity. So if you actually truncate, take a, if you take a supersymmetric theory of gravity, which contains apart from, apart from the bosons, it contains fermions, then assume that asymptotically there are no fermionic space states, which I can assume, and assume that AG bar going to zero, so the fermionic states are even not present in the loops, of quantum theory, then you might say, well, the energy of gravity should be positive. This is a tree approximation with no external, with no external, well, with, with no, fermionic, no fermionic states present. So, what is in red is understood. Okay. Yeah, so the idea is that in any state of quantum supergravity, if there is a honest quantum theory of supergravity, then in any state of quantum supergravity, the expectation ray value of energy is positive. Then if you take this limit from supergravity to gravity, if this limit again is positive, is possible, then uh, the same holds for gravity. Okay, uh, this is extremely nice, but, but completely formal, right? It doesn't really make, it doesn't really make much sense to, uh, well, you know, it, it indicates something, but it really requires the full, the full quantum supergravity and full control of quantum, of perturbative quantum supergravity at least, but of course we don't have it because it's, uh, although of course there are some interesting developments in supergravity, uh, in, in quantum supergravity pretty recently because they, it was proved to be in some cases finite. People hope that it's really a finite as a quantum theory. Anyway, uh, so uh, let me actually, in order to, to uh, what I wanted to, to report here to show you is uh, roughly is how goes how goes the proof of how goes the proof of positive energy theorem using supergravity, uh, which is uh, due to Horowitz and Strominger. Uh, the action, so, so this is the action of supergravity. It contains, it contains a, so, so let me spend a moment on this. It contains a standard gravity piece 
it can add the fermionic counterpart because of the supersymmetry, any bosonic degree of speed of mass per fermionic counterpart. So uh, the counterpart of, of tetrad or gravitational metric is, is the gravi so-called gravitina field of spin three halves. This just comes from, goes from representation theory. You can find that this theory is consistent, invariant under supersymmetry as I will, that I will show you in a moment. Uh, these are the equation of motion. The equation of motion essentially what the well, field equation is that the Einstein tensor is essentially proportional to the, to the fermionic contribution. And that, you know, this is, uh, and that, uh, that, that fermionic, the gravitino field satisfies this equation. It can be extended by some matter content if you like, right? You can couple some number of matter multiplets of essentially any kind, which might be, which is relevant for, uh, which is relevant for, 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 which might be relevant for you. Anyway, this is the, this is the, these are the transformations. And the transformation, well, the tetrad, which is the basic variable, this is a, uh, this is the first order, the second order formalism. So the tetra 1.5 order formalism, which is simpler, uh, the tetrad transforms to the gravitino, and gravitino transforms to uh, transforms in, the, in this way, which shows you that actually the gravitino is a gauge is a gauge field of is a gauge field of local supersymmetry. Then what you can show. Also, that if you actually combine two such transformations, then the, com the commutator of these two supersymmetry transformation is a combination of what? It's a combination of general coordinate transformation with this generated by this vector field composed of these two epsilons, uh, local rotation, and the local supersymmetry. But if you start, if you look at this, so let me spend a, a moment on this on this equation. If you look at it, you will see that if you think about asymptotically flat space time with no fermions in uh, in the in the asymptotic states, then this guy goes away because it's proportional to psi. This guy goes away because omega. Well, it's not doesn't completely go away. I think that this guy uh, this guy just gives you a Lorentz transformation. And this guy actually gives you this guy gives you the uh, this guy gives you the translation asymptotically and asymptotically the spinners become it become constant spinners and then this is just a this is just a rigid transformation a rigid translation so there is some seed already of the of the pos of the positive energy in this com in this in this commutator of two transformation this theory. Apart from the fact that you use the that, that you actually uh, uh, the spinners must be non-commutative, uh, anti-commutative, it, it's just a classical theory. Nothing about quantum theory. But they have to be anti-commutative. They must be anti-commuting because otherwise uh, the theory is not consistent. So, for example, the symmetry doesn't work. So, so there are some identities, some minus signs that would become plus signs if the, if, it's, if you have commuting instead of anti-commuting. But this is, uh, well, I mean, you, you, you can, there is a whole theory, Berezin theory of anti-commuting anti uh, Grassmann variables, and, and this seems to be perfectly okay. Good. So, uh, the, this, the, the idea, well, what, uh, what uh, Strominger and, uh, Strominger and uh, Horowitz actually started with, they, they show or they argue something that this commutator or the Poisson bracket was actually shown already by Titanmore and Dirac and Desert a few years before that. So if you if you take a, if you actually construct the Hamiltonian theory of uh, Hamiltonian theory of uh, of, uh, of supergravity, and then you can compute what are the asymptotic net charges, and then you can comp compute the symplectic form. You can comp compute the Dirac bracket. You need some gauge fixing. So at the end of the day, you can compute this Dirac bracket. This Dirac, Dirac bracket makes sense asympt asymptotically. It's actually taken is and it computes to be to be exactly this, which is reminds very much this expression that appears in the that appears in the Witten proof. Also, it follows directly from supersymmetry algebra that I was discussing a moment ago, that this anti-commutator is actually proportional to P mu, to some combination of momenta. Well, one thing they need is actually to fix the gauge from gravitino, 
and fixing the gauge from gravity. Now, this is some step that I that, that I, I, I think is kind of redundant. It's I, I'm not sure it's really necessary, but this is how it proceeds. So they assume some gauge condition for gravitino, and this result, and by uh, and by uh, and then by assuming that this gauge condition is that the, the, the residual gauge or residual symmetry is such that it preserves this gauge, it leads you exactly to the it leads you exactly to the equation that was a starting point for Witten. And we know that this equation, so this is the Sirac equation on the hypersurface, and we know that this equation, the only solution uh, as such that asymptotically this, this guy becomes non-zero non constant spinner. All right, and then there is a kind of an algebra, right? I mean, we, we have this expression and this expression, well, first of all, you see that, uh, uh, you see that it follows from this equation that energy is given again by something which is manifestly by something which is manifestly positive and this is for pure supergravity or pure gravity but then you can argue that you can just add the supermultiplets so some matter supermultiplets or add matter to supergravity in consistent way which would result in this with this contribution of tensor of energy momentum tensor of matter here Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, there, there is, of course, one. You're, you're right. Uh, and this, uh, uh, there is, of course, a dear, dirty trick there, which is that at some point they switch from anti committing spinners to committing one. Just by, but I think you can perform, you can again into, you, you can uh, again using this uh, Grassmannian structure and integrate of a Grassmannian, Grassmannian pole. But so indeed the trick is dirty, uh, but I don't think it's really, it's really that, uh, that devastating for, for the consistency of, of, of the proof. Okay, so this is essentially what I wanted to, what I wanted to tell you about, I think about the, positive energy theorem in the, in the different formulations. So the idea is essentially, uh, notice that the idea of this Strominger and, and Horowitz and also other people on Hull and, and other people prove is basically that you start with the conserved charges, which must satisfy something, which must satisfy the algebra, which is dictated by the symmetry algebra of the theory. And then you use some inequalities just to prove that the energy, the, the energy is positive. So by using the algebra of charges, you essentially end up at the starting point of the reasoning of Witten. Okay, so let me spend this remaining 10, 10 minutes just telling you about uh, our stuff and the motivation, the very motivation I already, so I borrowed these transparencies from my last year talk. So basically the motivation is to motivate that it's really interesting to, uh, to think about, to consider the boundary charges of the regions in, in, in thinking about gravity, uh, especially quantum gravity. Uh, and this is, this our project is actually an ex, uh, the next step in the project that we already started some time ago. So the idea is basically that if you think about the, if you think about the quantum field theory or perturbative quantum field theory, then essentially you can think of it as a bunch of Feynman diagrams. And what is the Feynman diagram? Feynman diagram is basically a number of lines that connect, at, at, that connect to each other at endpoints. There is a conservation law at the endpoints. So this is the point number one. And there are some, and there is a propagator, quantum mechanical propagator, but the quantum mechanical propagator is a, with, associated with the bulk is essentially expresses you for you, the, for, for you the constraints, right? The constraints that follows from essentially, you can, you can understand it as a, as a result of reparameterization invariance of the word line or of the, of the segment of the, of, the, of the Feynman graph. Okay, good. So you have a bulk, we have a constraint implemented in the bulk and you have some charges associated with, with the endpoints of the, of, the, of the segment. These charges are actually conserved. 
right? And essentially, there is a deep relation between this and, and the conservation and the conservation and the conservation of charges. And you construct the vertex just by assuming that the charge is conserved at the vertex. Okay, each particle belongs to some representation of Poincaré algebra. This is important. That in, not only you have the not only you have this conserved charge, but this conserved charge are essentially labeled by the representation theory of Poincaré algebra. And the whole quantum field theory is basically just at, at the very basic is as as people used to say long ago, it's nothing but the representation theory of Poincaré algebra. Okay, well, but so what is essential actually? What is much more interesting are these boundary charges than, than what's happening in the bulk. So the idea, uh, well, there is a gauge invariant, let me skip this one. So the idea is to, to think about, try to think about the gravity in the following way, in a similar way. So you have a region in space time, you have some wheeler david equation operating in the bulk, and there is a, there are some charges associated with the boundaries. And then you may try to combine some regions into, into larger space time just by using similar, so, so similar to the construction of Feynman diagrams, you use, you combine these bubbles into, into bigger entity just by using the representation theory of the, of, of, of the, of the, of the charges, of the symmetries, of the symmetries, uh, which are expressed by the charges uh, calculated in the moment. Sorry? Well, it, yeah, quantum gravity, yes. So, so this is, what I want just to motivate here is that it's of interest really to consider the finite regions, Carl compute the charges and try to understand what these charges are telling you. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Uh, I'm not uh, telling you that I know how to quantize gravity and how to use this whatever representation theory, but I just want to motivate uh, that it's interesting to consider these charges. So then, uh, since there are this nice thing that there are this nice thing about uh, there is a this positive energy theorem which is for some inequalities. So okay, so since there are some algebraic inequalities coming from symmetry for us uh, and can be used as a starting point for positive energy theorem uh, for asymptotic state, the idea is, and this is the idea of the project that we didn't finish yet, to actually do that the same thing for finite regions. Just try to see what the charges are. What is the algebra? Can we actually get something interesting from that? Uh, I think I have five minutes, so I will not really, I will just flash the transparencies. This is just the Einstein gravity in some. Okay, all right. So, uh, yeah, but, but he, will, he will hear us and he will just jump in and he says that I need to stop in five seconds. So. Uh, <laughs> That's true. All right. So the idea is basically that you say that, that you can formulate gravity as a BF action in two in two ways. This is something that I explained in detail on my uh, on my talk last year. So one 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 way is actually to introduce the B field multiplied by the curvature of omega, and then assume that the B field is essentially satisfies. Uh, is essentially this thing where gamma is a multi parameter and star is just a dual and dual in this gauge parameter. So this is the Lorentz group. Okay, so the, it's a gauge theory. It's a BF theory for Lorentz. You start with a BF theory for Lorentz group, and then you actually impose the condition, which is actually called the simplicity constraint. And there is another approach, which is kind of more dynamical, that instead you start with a gauge, with a gauge uh, BF theory for uh, ADS group, let's say. Uh, and instead of uh, using this, you actually explicitly or manifestly break this symmetry down to Lorentz by adding this, this term. And then you can show that this theory, the equation, field equation of this theory and this theory are actually identical, they're just Einstein equation. The difference is, however, that in the second, that there are the differences in, the, in topological term that appear in the action which of course do not change anything about field equations, but they change a lot about the conserved charges. So these are, the, so this are our field equations. The field equation, this is the equation for torsion. You can check that this equation actually can be solved uh, to give uh, torsion, the, the standard equation, the torsion is equal zero. And this are uh, the Einstein equation. This is 
there is a cosmological constant necessary. Actually, it makes sense to go to, go to the limit with lambda go to zero uh, in this uh, for the bulk, but it doesn't. But, but the charges actually, the, 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 but it doesn't. It, it cannot be done for the charges. So the charges are defined only for finite lambda. So we stick to the positive, to the negative energy, uh, negative cosmological constant in this. These are the Einstein equation with a cosmological constant. This term actually is manifest is actually identically zero when torsion is zero. That's by just by Bianchi identity. I see a token. Sorry? I see a token here. Oh yeah. <laughs> Good. Actually, yeah, all right, behavior. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, it was not intended. As I, uh, uh, I, as I told you at the beginning, I, I intended to be that serious. Okay, so now we can extend this. This is pretty simple. Well, no, not completely trivial technically, but uh, conceptually it's pretty simple to extend this theory to the case, to the supergravity case, just you call you to, to this term, to this bosonic case, you to this bosonic terms, you add fermionic terms. Of exactly the same structure. And to this gauge breaking terms down to Lorentz, you add the gauge breaking terms. So the essentially this epsilon and gamma five go one hand to hand. And this was done uh, 10 years ago. And actually now I can tell you the joke because you know, when I was young and Jurek was young and Krzysztof was young and, and Jacek was young, and even Professor Kioski was young at the time. I remember that in nearly in late 70s, when I was a student, everybody used to tell me that when you're getting old, you start working on the problems that you didn't solve when you were young and you were smart, because they are the only problems you can solve. So, so when you were young, you didn't, you didn't care to, about this problem because you thought they were trivial and boring. But when you're getting old, you actually go back to these problems because there is every, everything that you can do. So indeed, I must get, and, and actually, well, more to it, I actually did my PhD on positive energy theorem. So, uh, so indeed, there might be some truth in it. Anyway, and this paper, when we constructed, it's also 10 years ago, and I, I'm coming back to it. Uh, essentially, essentially, uh, these are the transformations of, of the fields. These are the supersymmetry transformation for the field. We're using here the first of the formalism, which E and omega are uh, independent fields. This transformation look a little bit different than uh, a little bit different than the uh, uh, than the one I showed before. But this is just a re this is just because we had uh, this is just because we have. Uh, a cosmological constant L is roughly the square root of cosmological constant, inverse square root of cosmological constant. Okay, here are the, the other symmetries. Uh, then there is a nice prescription to actually, if I have an action of this form, there is a nice prescription to how to define, uh, first of all, how to derive what is the symplectic structure, which gives you a surface integral. I, I discuss it a lot. So, so you see that this guy essentially contains, so if I take a variation of this, you, you get the term which are proportional to equation of motion. And the only term which is not proportional to equation of motion can be expressed as a, can be expressed as a total differential. So if you unshell, this is zero and you end up with this one. So this is the presymplectic form. This is the symplectic form, just uh, having this form. So you know that the, you, you may say that there is a position, this is the momentum. So B field is essentially the is essentially a momentum of the of the connection. And then if I have a, if I have the if I have a symplectic form, you can show you quite in general that if I have a local if I have a local symmetry in the theory, you can construct a conserved charges in the sense that uh, if I contract the symmetry transformation with omega with symplectic form, the resulting object is actually a delta, a variation of something, which is, which is essentially, which is essentially the, uh, which is essentially a, a, a net charge. But this net charge can be actually associated with any finite region. 
with the boundary. So if I have any finite region with a boundary, I can always associate uh, I can always associate an object like this. The particular, particularly important thing about infinity is that there is no flow through infinity. But if I have infinite region, then in principle can, can be a flow. So you, uh, you can define mass infinite region? Uh, that's, exactly the, that's exactly the idea of this exercise. Because I can define mass by using the supersymmetry transformation. Okay, and then the idea is what would be the property of the mass. Uh, all right, uh, I, I'm 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 and I'm closing to the end. Uh, we managed to compute the the supersymmetry transfer, the supersymmetry charge, which has which has this form, uh, and we actually managed also to compute the algebra, but we didn't have time to to analyze it. So the idea is exactly what Jacek said a moment ago, the idea is actually to try to define uh, energy and momentum and angular momentum for finite regions just by using the algebra of, of this upper of this uh, of this uh, charges. Well, the nice thing about this procedure is that this provides you immediately with a symplectic structure for the for the for 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 the boundary. So you know how to compute uh, how to compute the how to compute the algebra of charges? On the other hand, from the representation theory, we know that the algebra of charges must reproduce their algebra of symmetries, the commutator of symmetries, and this will let us actually try to identify some objects. So, give the, some objects the name of energy and angular momentum and stuff. So, here are the questions. Well, the first question, is, the, the first observation which I want to share with you is that uh, remember this Newtonian argument that I, that I actually made at the very beginning. This Newtonian argument seems to work fine for any finite region, right? I mean, of course, it's not precise and, and stuff, but uh, that this suggests that perhaps there is something about positive energy, something like this can be, can be defined, can, can be can be defined for energy and perhaps some, some inequivalent inequalities concerning energy can be defined uh, consistently for the finite regions. Uh, the question is how to reproduce this uh, positive energy theorem argument and to see, so if I identify energy, I don't really expect that this energy may be positive to, 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 to get some strong inequalities, but perhaps there would be some relation so, for example, there might be a flow of matter through the boundary, which would change energy, of course. For, for some regions, you, you will have positive for some other. That, that's what I expect. That's what I expect. The problem, the, the point is that I would like to understand better why and what, 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 are, what are the properties of the regions that actually, that actually well, that I can extract from, the, from this algebraic argument. Uh, well, so the, the, the question is, and also, I mean, something that bothers me for, for, for quite a long time, I mean, people are claiming that the charges for finite region actually might be taken to be an observables, both in classical and in quantum theory. And what bothers me is a question, uh, if they're observables, they might be, they should be physically observable, which means the question is, what is the operational well-defined procedure to measure these charges. So suppose I have a, some, the, this procedure gives me a, some fine, finite region, gives me some charge, which is a net charge, right? But the question is how I measure what, is this charge three or seven? I know. You take same type of routine. No, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. But forget you have some bosonic. You have some bosonic observables, right? Like energy. Okay. The question is, uh, even in, in the, even in pure gravity, forget about supergravity. You have a charges associated with a finite region. You can actually you can actually find the, the algebra. There are charges associated with Lorentz transformation. There are charges associated with general corner transformation. Perfect. Question is, if they are observable, they must exist a well-defined physical way of measuring them, right? I mean, in asymptotically ADS, in this asymptotically flat space times, uh, Androvid, Dizer, and Meissner, they actually say that there are charges 
that are measured by, you know, physical instrument asymptotically, right? The energy is really an energy. That was some point of a debate of long class debate in general relativity. The energy is just an energy. Uh, the momentum is a momentum, right? You, you can have, you can put your, you make some calorimeter, uh, I don't know. You, you can, can have some well-defined measure, measurement procedure for asymptotic observers and measure, right? We measure actually, we, we measure masses in the universe. Yes, but with a finite region, it's a fundamental problem. Take and hydrogen uh, atom. And you ask in a finite sphere, mm -hmm. what is the charge inside the sphere? Since you have quantum fluctuation that, that can be either within the sphere and outside of the sphere, you cannot answer this question that you have a well-defined charge, charge within your sphere. That's not a well-defined object. Mm. Only if you go to infinity, you can say the charge is zero. But if you have a finite sphere surrounding a hydrogen atom, you cannot say what is the charge inside because fluctuations can be either electron can be outside of this sphere. Yeah, yes, yes. Sphere. So that's exactly the same problem. Uh, uh, not, uh, well, but this, this is a quantum problem, right? In classical theory, there are no fluctuations. And besides, besides. Sorry, but if you have anti commuting operators, you are explicitly quantum. Uh, all right. Okay. Go. 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 All right. Okay. 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 I agree. Uh, well, I agree to some extent, but then forget about so forget about supergravity. Think about pure gravity. You can define some objects, some some net charges for finite regions. In the procedure I told. Uh, yeah, I, but I, can, but uh, hold on. Hold on. It's not Newtonian. It's it's com full geometry. If you have gravitational weight and you cannot measure that by, by Newtonian physics, you don't know how many, how much of the energy already is away outside of your sphere, how much is inside of your sphere. Well, there is some flow. Well, what I only want to say in this in this last remark, my last remark was only that. Uh, Forget about supergravity because supergravity is the tool to get some more information. But if you think about the pure gravity, I can I can I can have a I can have a uh, net charge associated with say general corner transformation, so say momenta, okay, associated with a finite region. My question, no, it's not a weak. No, no, not at all. Why? I'm talking about the boundary, not about the bound. Hamiltonian is zero. On the boundary, I have something. Uh, Question is, what is the operational procedure? It's just a very naive question that I can measure it. Well, I don't know that there are some, is there any congruence of, of uh, I don't know, free of uh, test particles that I can actually look at and, uh, and, and then from, uh, from the geodesic behavior, I can, I can reproduce this charge. There was some paper about it. Uh, or there is something like, you know, the, or there is something like this memory effect, right? Gravi electromagnetic memory effect that you put the charges on the, you put the charges on the, on the surface. And then when the electromagnetic wave passes, the configuration of charges changes, right? So, so this kind of op operational defi well-defined objects or notions, uh, and I think it's a, it's a deep and interesting question. So for, for getting supergravity, for getting everything, if I have some conserved char network charges associated with finite regions, the question is, could I measure them in principle or couldn't I, right? <laughs> All right, so, and that's it, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for your very nice talk. And we had, we had many questions, but maybe still we have still some time to just to, to, to ask, you know, to have some questions. So I, I, I'm outside, so uh, communicate with Jerzy if you have some questions, okay? Mm -hmm. Cześć. Uh, Jurek. Uh... May I ask a question now? Yeah, yeah sure. Pia. So uh, you mentioned that you're going to do an algebra of charges. So uh, I'm assuming that you're talking about the Poisson brackets or something like that. 
Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a uh, integrals and you define Poisson brackets on uh, thinking using the naive symplectic form on the space part uh, on your on your hypersurface, then uh, the bracket you're going to calculate with your charges will not be uh, reproduce the standard algebra because you'll get boundary terms. Uh, which have nothing to do with the problem of hand. So how do you handle that? Uh, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't completely get it. I'm not sure I understand what, you, what you're saying. Okay. Uh, So if you want to write something, please write very big because it's hard to see. Okay, Online. good. So, so let me, so, uh, well, you know, this procedure that I very briefly, that I very briefly described actually gives you, it gives you the charges, let me call it H, which basically have, a, in general, they have a, uh, they have a, so if I have a region, well, you get an integral of a, a set, and maybe you also get a. Sometimes it's only a boundary integral, and so forth. Right. But, uh, I mean, usually, the, usually for for usual. Your, uh, some bracket. Yeah. Okay. So, so there is a, some some expression here, plus some boundary term. Maybe it's only boundary. Who cares? Sorry. Maybe it's only boundary, like in. Well, it may be usually. Well, for for many, uh, well, for lo for local Lorentz, for example, this is something that I don't understand really. But this is something also I, I would like to understand better. So, for example, for local Lorentz symmetry, it's only it's only it's only it's only boundary term. But for general corner transformation, it uh, seems to be both bulk and boundary. And uh, for supersymmetry, it also is. Both bulk and boundary, so they are both bulk and boundary contributions. But I have, I also have omega, so I have the symplectic structure, which also contain has uh, uh, has this uh, boundary and uh, it has the boundary and uh, and corner terms. And in general, if I would like to compute, if I if I'm to compute the the Poisson bracket of of two objects. Uh, then I use uh, that I have to use the that I have to use the symplectic structure. However, if I want to compute the uh, the Poisson brackets of the the Poisson brackets of the of two charges, the only thing I really need to do is to take the symmetry transformation with parameter one acting on the charge on the charge two. Yeah, and so if you do this, you're going to get a boundary term if you do this, and that, and that's, which will not reproduce the, the normal algebra. So you, what do you mean the normal algebra? The normal algebra, the it's not to be a representation of supersymmetry algebra, of global supersymmetry algebra, that's what you're saying? Yes, no, no. well, you're going to get terms which are not, uh, which are, I mean, normally you'd get, uh, yeah, you'd like to reproduce the algebra they started with. So say if you're taking about, uh, space-time deformation, so take two uh, asymptotic um, rotations, or well, actually rotation works, but uh, two asymptotic um, symmetries, and uh, you're going to get something which is not the charge associated with the commutator of the symmetries. Uh, okay, good, so, uh, point taken, I, I need to check it. So what you're claiming is that, that uh, this, uh, this bracket of two charges is not going to be uh, combination of charges anymore the standard bracket is not going to be uh, so so maybe there is a way of i th and so because you said you have an algebra then i thought you had a way of uh adapting okay well the so, so this so is something as i told you as i told you at the beginning this is this is a good point thank you very much uh, i will have to check it uh, but as i said this is actually a starting point of this project so we just did some technical calculations to start with, but now the investigation of the algebra is, is still ahead of us. But thank you okay, for- Okay, thank you, yeah. Okay, uh, so the last uh, very short question, please. I can't hear any. 
so let me have one question okay sure uh, so suppose suppose there is no uh, uh the, the super symmetry is not the symmetry uh, symmetry of nature okay and now mm -hmm. i've got a fairly naive question is there any proof that physical quantum hamiltonian of asymptotic free flat space time described by general relativity should be positive definite Mm, uh, uh, that's a good question. I don't think there is any possible proof of that because uh, in order to make, to make it precise, to make it formal, you really need to know what are the asymptotic states of quantum gravity. So you really need to, in order to, to answer the question, you, yourself a question, what is the, if the uh, expectation value of Hamiltonian of gravity uh, for uh, be between asymptotic states is always positive. You really need to know, first of all, what is the quantum Hamiltonian? And secondly, what are the states? So to, for that, you need the fully quantized quantum gravity, I would believe. So the answer is, uh, I, if, I, if, I, if I understand the, the question correctly, my answer would be that, uh, I, I don't know. I would believe, Naively speaking, I would believe that it should be so, but uh, uh, but of course I have no idea how to make this proof precise. Okay, thank you. So uh, let us uh, thank the speaker again. And.